Fed's starting to cut rates um, because they see the economy softening. Every time the Fed has cut rates, gold has doubled over the next few years. It happened in 2000, it happened in 2008, and it happened in 2019. Gold doubled in every one of those situations. As the price of gold goes higher, there's more value being driven into these companies' projects. There's companies trading at 100 mil and a project's worth a billion dollars that contain a few million ounces of gold at a good gold grade. And the valuation gap is getting wider and wider. Why? Because the retail market hasn't shown up yet. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we typically discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the at JR Mining Guy on X and of course, your host of this channel. You might have noticed I added a typically in my introduction and if you're a regular viewer who's already annoyed by macro to micro, today we're going to focus on the micro. I'm joined by Garrett Goggin. He's the chief analyst and founder of the Golden Portfolio. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion because we're going to talk a lot about gold, silver, but also mining stocks. What's, what's the sentiment right now? You might tell I'm quite exuberant right now. I've had a couple of good phone calls before this interview, and I'm really in a positive mood. My, my mood has changed about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and I think sentiment in our space is changing alongside as well, which is a really positive indicator. It's still early days, and I'm really curious what, the, what my guest thinks about the sector and the sentiment. He recently launched his new newsletter and uh, there must be a reason for it. So I'm going to ask him about it, why he decided to do it now and not uh, two years ago or so. So I'm really curious what his thoughts are. And uh, before I switch over to my guest, please hit that like and subscribe button. I know 80% of you watching are not subscribed to the channel. It helps us out tremendously. Thank you so much. Now, without much further ado, Garrett, it is great to have you on the program. It's good to see you again. Hey, Kai. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. We we have to catch up because uh, your world has changed a bit, a little bit. You launched a newsletter, the Golden Portfolio, and uh, we we have to talk. Maybe let's start with the origin story, real quick, of the Golden Portfolio newsletter before uh, I ask you about uh, the state of the economy and everything else. But uh, Garrett, why'd you launch a Golden uh, Golden Portfolio? Yeah, sure. So uh, I've been with Stansberry Research and uh, Gold Stock Analyst for fifteen years. And with the way the gold uh, market was setting up, it was a perfect opportunity for me to capitalize. And then, you know, I'm a CFA, MBA, you know, from the Northeast, uh, basically dedicated my career to the gold and silver mining market. And I've been I've been analyzing these companies for, you know, decades. And then what I've seen is, you know, the majors, the companies people think of to invest in the sector, like Newmont, Barrick, they're at the same price they were 20 years ago. They haven't moved. Uh, why? Because when inflation pushes gold higher, costs follow. So these miners' margins remain constrained. Uh, so I started uh, looking at different sectors of the gold and silver market and to the explorers and developers and royalties. And I found some great ways, basically the, the golden portfolio, you know, a basket of royalties since 2007 has returned 13,000 percent. You know why? Uh, because, you know, their costs are fixed. They've got free exploration upside. They have minimal, minimal employees that run by three or four or five guys. And then uh, within the royalty industry, the big fish always eat the small fish. You get smaller royalty companies. Once they develop uh, an asset up to a significant size that looks promising or they uh, develop a significant portfolio, they all get bought out. You get Nomad, you get Mavericks, you get Abitibi, you get EMX. I could go on and on and on, but there's massive consolidation within the sector. So that's one of my products. And then I've got the GP10X um, and it's perfect timing for that because it's a smaller explorers, developers, um, and smaller miners that really ramp when the gold price ramps in. You know, the price of gold's done great, right, Kai? We're all watching it, but like there's a valuation gap going on right now. People look at the price of gold, they're like, oh, it's a little too high. I disagree with that. I'll tell you why more. But as the price of gold goes higher, there's more value being driven into these companies' projects. There's companies trading at a hundred mil and a project's worth a billion dollars that contain a few million ounces of gold at a good gold grade. And the valuation gap is getting wider and wider. Why? Because the retail market hasn't shown up yet. And one of the reasons I know the retail market hasn't shown up yet, other than anecdotal stuff, 
Um, you look at the uh, price of the GLD, right, which tracks a tenth, it's equal to a tenth of an ounce of gold. GLD shares outstanding is equal to that. So whenever money comes in or leaves, the shares are created or destroyed. GLD shares outstanding are down 30% from the peak in 2011. They're at 300 mil in the peak in 2011. They were 450 mil that investors aren't allocating towards gold yet, but they will. Um, even institutional investors are always late to the party. They're going to get dragged in by lagging performance. As these gold stocks take, start taking off, they're going to have to get involved with the sector because the gold stocks are performing well. And we've been waiting years, if not decades, for the perfect opportunity. And it, we're looking at it right now. Oh, absolutely. I really appreciate the intros. Like, it's really got me pumped up even more, Garrett. And uh, But we need to do some homework first. We maybe need to lay some groundwork. Like, why are we at this point? And why are we so excited? Like, the two of us, obviously, we're in the in the mining space here. Like, but why are we so excited? Let's start with the state of the economy. Um, let, let's give us a bit of an overview. Like, where, where's the economy at right now? Obviously, if it were positive, we wouldn't be too pumped about it. But uh, l l l let's set the foundation here, Garrett. Yeah, well, you know, quite simply... You know, the Fed's starting to cut rates um, because they see the economy softening. Every time the Fed has cut rates, gold has doubled over the next few years. It happened in 2000, it happened in 2008, and it happened in 2019. Gold doubled in every one of those situations. And I know people are a little worried now, rate cut expectations are off, but every time the Fed starts cutting rates, they always continue cutting rates. The only reason why they're easing off the uh, gas pedal right now is because the market continues higher. The Fed basically only cuts when the market gets weak. Uh, and that's going to be reflected in, you know, uh, reflecting the economic weakness. But, you know, inflation is a major problem right now. I got three little kids. You know, you look at food price, you've seen some anecdotal stuff of, uh, you know, your food bill from three years ago to now. It, it's up, you know, 200 percent. It's up three X. Uh, inflation is ridiculous. Yes, inflation has uh, slowed down a little bit. So now it's, you know, whatever, about 2% a year, but it's still up 100% plus from a few uh, prior years. And let me let me throw this out there. Um, people believe the Fed's mandate is to, uh, you know, to control, to keep the price of inflation low and to produce employment. What if I were to tell you that the Fed's real mandate is to produce bubbles to keep this debt finance economy going because if they don't the whole thing's going to fall apart so every time the fed started cutting rates in 2001 2007 2019 they laid on the liquidity not only fed rate cuts but as far as growing the fed's balance sheet as far as spending the u.s government just spent 350 billion dollars in the first week of october that's like 13 trillion dollars our deficits are like 35 trillion dollars it's not going to slow down whether it's a democrat with uh kamala or uh trump the republican the spending is going to continue and gold's going to uh continue higher yeah you know there'll be moves up and down but over the longer term gold's going to be much higher and every way i look at it you know i see gold i don't know three thousand four thousand five thousand in a few years but the problem with the mining sector is uh when the inflation pushes the price of gold higher as i said before it pushes mining costs higher so even though the price of gold will be double in a few years from now uh, some of the miners will be no more profitable uh, than they are right now because their costs have increased. And that's why the golden portfolio is structured the way it is towards royalties and the smaller explorers and developers. No, awesome. Like, that's a really good uh, over overview of the overall market. And I got to challenge you on the last point you made, and uh, it's the margins for the miners. I'm really curious. Uh, we've seen a lot of margin compression, obviously, in the run-up of COVID. We've seen wage inflation, oil prices exploded. Co costs just exploded. Newmont's all in sustaining costs are over fifteen hundred dollars, roughly, right to fifteen thirty or something. Um, we're expecting Q three numbers here in the next four or six weeks. Um, let, let, let's discuss that margins because um, I'm curious. Like, if you, if you say gold goes to five thousand, let's make a simple assumption here, right? You said it's it's going to double. Let's assume it was at twenty five hundred when the Fed cut happens. So five thousand. What else needs to happen around that, like in the economy, for gold to go to five thousand? And uh, why are you saying margins are going to be? still compressed or like not expanding let's say not expanding right um yeah well you know the the mining industry the margins uh on a cash cost basis range from about 70 percent down to 40 percent right now they're starting to creep up at 50 percent but there's an opportunity there right because the gold price has really spiked up the mining costs haven't spiked up margins are climbing and i think a lot of the business financial business today is quantitative driven 
Um, like a lot of times the companies don't move until their numbers actually hit, you know, Bloomberg or their release. But as a mining analyst, I can, I can, I project, you know, cash costs and with a higher gold price and operating cash flow, free cash flow is, is starting to grow and explode at these miners. So the next couple quarters for these large cap miners, um, you know, is going to be a, is going to be a surprise for a lot of people, not for me. Um, so, you know, I do anticipate a couple good quarters coming up for, uh, the large cap miners. No, perfect. He's like, do you, do you have a bit of a breakdown for us? Like, I'm, I'm curious, like for the big miners, as, as I said, new ones, all in sustaining costs is 1530. Um, I'm just trying to gauge a little bit, like what, what could that trigger? Like, let's assume Q3 numbers. Everybody said, oh, wait, Q2 numbers, the journalists are going to come in. They're going to see the margin expansion. Well, not, not, nothing has happened of that sort. Do you think the Q3 numbers will be that trigger um, for the journalists to understand, oh, there's, there's money to be made. Uh, you know, the ratios are starting to make sense. Um, the multiples are starting to make sense for us to come in and uh, let's, let's make a return here. Like, can, can you break that down for us a little bit? Like, what, what are you expecting? Yeah, you know, third quarter, uh, you know, the gold price is really ramp. Uh, costs, you know, are probably about the same as second quarter. If you start modeling that in, free cash flow and operating cash flow is going to start, you know, increasing tremendously. And, you know, that's always been the hit on miners. You know, Newmont was paying a dividend that they weren't even making enough profits in a year to cover. But, you know, now they are. Uh, so that's going to attract a lot of institutional money and retail money back into the sector. No, ab absolutely. I'm fully with you. And I really hope the, the generalist investor sort of wakes up to that. There's a lot of money sitting in managed money market funds that are not yielding as much as they used to maybe six months ago. And uh, maybe they will come back and, look and seek some returns in our, in our space. Like, I'm, I don't want the five trillion dollars to move into our sector because uh, that'd be absolutely ridiculous. But uh, I'd be happy with 500 to a billion maybe at first, you know? Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> the percentage of portfolios that are allocated toward gold or gold stocks is absolutely minimal right now. Um, you know, no one cares. And then, I, you know, I run, you know, the golden portfolio. I've got a portfolio up 145% year to date and another one up 45% year to date. You know, it's just the returns, the smart people are seeing the returns there right now. Oh, 100 percent. And uh, I think and I mentioned that in interviews, actually, as well. We've just seen a, 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 a case of. A proof, uh, a case study, sort of a proof of concept is the word I was looking for. Apologies. A proof of concept, like gold is up about 25, 26 percent year to date. GDX is up pretty much similar ratio, like a 25, 26 yeah. percent. Um, Newmont up very similar rate. So the, the mining stocks can move. But in, historically, I'm curious if you can uh, validate what I'm about to say next year. They usually outperform gold three to one, the mining stocks. Right? Uh, so I'm curious. Cycles. They have cycles where they outperform gold three to one. And this is the beginning of the cycle that we're looking at. Yes. That's exactly what I mean. So, you know, the train is slowly starting to move. It hasn't left the station at all. Maybe the first car just pulled out out of 15 or whatever it is. Right. So does that analogy make sense? Is that something you would agree with? This is a proof of concept. Let's uh, the mining stocks have started to move. Wait for the Q3 numbers, then jump in. You know? Yeah, you know, not even wait for third. Like, you know, I'm a mining list. I, I, I'll, you know, I've got my models. You pro, you plug in a twenty five hundred dollar gold price for third quarter, and you see the free cash flow and operating cash flow jump. Like I said, uh, it's a lot of quantitative driven that aren't jumping in until they see those numbers hit. You know, actually hit the tape. But, um, you know, third quarter is going to be a good quarter. And, you know, these mining companies, they do have sectors of outperformance, right? Just they're not accretive that like over the longer term, um, they don't grow from uh, one to five to 10 to 50 to 100. You know, they they will go from, you know, two dollars per share up to, you know, whatever, six or ten dollars per share. Then they start trading back down once costs catch up. But right now is the sweet spot. Oh, 100%. Right now is like, as I said, proof of concept. Now, now is the time to get in if you were nervous about the sector before, right? Um, in, in your modeling, like, what, what do you count for mostly? Like, and what do you think is going to hit and maybe change momentum if there's anything? I'm thinking maybe oil price without trying to put words in your mouth or anything here. I'm curious, uh, in your model, what's the most, uh, what do you call it? The most, vol not volatile, the most, uh, pers uh, I'm missing a word here, but uh, the most, uh, the point of attack, like, where could, where's the weakness? Yeah, you know, oil, the price of gasoline is down, right? The price of oil is down. There's all this, you know, conflict around the world. I, you know, to be honest with you, um, I'm watching the news now. I live in Florida, right? We're getting a hurricane. I'm over the East Coast. We're all safe. Tampa's going to get destroyed. But, um, you know, the news, it, it changes every day. And people get all amped up. Oh, inflation's slowing down. Oh, inflation's picking up. Oil's going down. Oil's going up. Listen, the Fed's piling on trillions of dollars of debt. 
gold's going to be higher in a few years from now. Gold is the place to be. No matter what party uh, is going to win the election, uh, gold is going to prove to be a good investment as it has over the past whatever thousand years. And then I'm buried in the fundamental analysis of these companies. And I, I seek to align myself with value generators of the industry. Whether the price of gold and silver goes up or down, these CEOs are able to drive value from their projects through exploration and coming out with economic studies um, you know, in, in order to produce more underlying value for the company. And these miners, you know, are a lot majority are not keeping up with the price of gold right now. Um, price of gold's gone up, but these mining companies, a lot of them are still languishing. They're only up a few percent year to date. There's a few that are up a lot. Uh, but, you know, I tend to stick, I, I'm a fundamental analyst and I tend to steer clear um, of the, you know, economic wiggles. Economic wiggles. I like that term. I'm sure it's defined in the in the dictionary, but uh, it, it makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm 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 uh, but, but, I'm but with you there. I, but then by focusing on the fundamentals, I'm able to maintain an even keel, and I see the undervaluation of these projects, and I see the value generation of these projects. So, like the price of gold and silver have been down a couple of days doesn't bother me at all because I just see these companies being valued more. You know, I just spoke to, you know, uh, Benoit LaSalle at Aya. You know, people love Zagounder. Uh, Zagounder is pure silver. They're bumping up to about 3,500 tons a day. Uh, but their costs are going to go down. Their profits are going to go up 4x, 5x. But a lot of people aren't even looking at boomedine. Boomedine is like 23 million tons of material, at about 400 grams a ton average grade. It's extremely economic. You start modeling that as I do, it, it's it's worth billions, you know, and it's worth Zagound, worth more than Zagounder alone. And so I start looking at these and adding the numbers up, especially with the higher gold and silver price. And the value is absolutely compelling. You're spending dimes to pick up dollars. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. And uh, you, you brought up silver. So maybe let's stay on that thematic here for a second. Um, how do you see silver developing as well? Sort of is it going to go uh, hand in hand with gold? Are we going to see a, a price sort of appreciation as well? Is it going to meander around the $30 mark much longer? Like, yeah, what you know, uh, silver is more volatile. So as gold goes higher, silver will follow. Silver goes on massive uh, runs. Uh, but those are pretty short lived. The thing that I really like this year um, is that silver, you know, it's between it's gone 32. It's trading at 30, but it's been higher for quarter after quarter after quarter. This is driving profits uh, because, you know, they're selling silver on a daily basis. So as long as the average cost is higher, they're making more and more money. Um, and the uh, one of the things regarding the silver industry is uh, it's generally not as profitable as the gold sector because the, the majority of silver miners self concentrate. Not all of them. I, uh, you know, pure silver, they produce dory bars. Concentrate, they only get paid like 85% of the uh, contained metal in there. Uh, so the margins are smaller. Um, and there's a lot of people out there on Twitter and everywhere else, and they're going after the lower grade, uh, uneconomic moose pastures that, you know, tread water year after year. And then when the price of silver really gets going, they ramp up, uh, you know, 5X, 10X. But this, the big silver and gold ramps only happen like, I don't know, 3% of the time, but that other 90% of the time, they're diluted, they keep selling shares. <laughs> Um, I'd rather position myself for the other 97% of the time. And then, you know, one of the things too is, um, you know, I'm friends with Peter McGow, world famous silver uh, geologist, and he's shared this thing uh, called Archie's rule. And it has to do with grade. In order to find economic deposits, you need to have uh, your net smelter revenue needs to be 2x operating costs. Uh, and that's driven entirely by grade, right? Because costs are relatively fixed on a per tonnage basis. The only thing that moves the needle for profits is grade. The more higher grade, the more revenue you get, um, which, you know, falls right to the bottom line. Uh, so, you know, I stick to these, you know, high grade, highly profitable miners. And a lot of people think these lower grade ones, you know, they ramp up when the price of gold and silver get wrong. But look at uh, Lending Gold with Fruta del Norte in Ecuador. You know, that's one of the leading gold stocks. That's the best gold deposit in the world. They have extremely high grades. I think of 11 grams a ton. They generate a tremendous amount of free cash flow. They're paying dividends. They buy back shares. Good things happen to highly profitable companies and vice versa. Bad things happen to the low grade stuff. 
good things happen to good companies. Silvercrest has been bought by Core uh, for one point seven billion dollars. Really curious your thoughts. Your 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 head just sacked. So I'm curious. Uh, yeah, no. Did, no I'm curious on, to hear your opinion. I've been on that start for ten years. Uh, Silvercrest Metals, run by Eric Fear, uh, was operating uh, Santa Elena, and uh, it was a relatively underknown company. Their profits, they were generating about a 20, 25% free cash flow profit, which meant their shares were extremely undervalued. I got in back in 2015 with Silvercrest Mines. Um, and then at first Majestic came in, they bought it out. And then Eric Fear spun out uh, Silvercrest Metals. That was uh, Silvercrest 2.0, um, later renamed Silvercrest Metals with Les Chispas. And the, all my followers received a free stock dividend of Silvercrest Metals that started trading at about 12 cents per share. It got taken out, I'm talking US terms, it got taken out at uh, 11, about $11 per share. That's at like a 10,000% return. And then Eric's a value generator. He's one of the, he's one of the CEOs that I seek to align myself with. You know, he created value at Silvercrest Mining, created uh, value at Silvercrest Metals. And just, you got to have faith in these guys. You got to follow the guys that own shares in the companies that are aligned with shareholders that profit when they Price, when the share price rises uh, along with you, because believe it or not, a lot of the mining companies, especially the, the large ones and the smaller ones, they're not aligned with shareholders. They don't care where the share price goes. And then as far as the valuation goes, it was, uh, what, 1.6 bill. You look at um, you look at Las Chispas, it's extremely high grade of about 450 grams per ton. Uh, they're churning out profits here to pay back their 40 mil debt in less than a year, put 100 mil cash in the bank. But if you throw it into a nav and the hit on Las Chispas is it's really narrow grade. Um, their mine life isn't tremendously long. Um, but if you put a 10 year nav, it's only worth about 1.1 bill. So I, I'm happy with the deal. I think Silvercrest Metals got a good deal from uh, core mining. Yeah, they own 37 percent of core now. So. That's uh, that's not a bad deal from 11 cents to 11 to or 12 cents to 11 bucks. Yeah. Uh, and now owning 37 percent of a formerly massive producer. Yeah. And, that... and Eric is um, working on Silvercrest 3.0. Yeah. As far so as I think there's going to be another spin out, I think, is in the works already from mm -hmm. what I understand. So f f f tremendous deal. Really, really excited for the. For, for the group around uh, Silvercrest and of course all the investors like a tremendous success story and uh, hope mining Hall of Fame material like undoubtedly that's uh, there I don't think there's any doubt about that um we went down the rabbit hole of silver real quick but uh, I've got a follow-up question like the gold silver ratio like I want to talk about silver price and gold price relationship like we're trading around 85 ish right now I'm curious what your thoughts are on that is that even a measure that you look at should we be looking at and uh, is there a number that you're targeting? Yeah. All right. So like <laughs> I, I, I watch a lot of these interviews and there's guys talk about gold 10,000. They talk about silver gold, you know, 20 X ratio, you know, yeah, maybe back in the 1500s, you know, CFA, MBA, I do a lot of quantitative stuff. Uh, that ratio, the average has been, I don't know, about 55. And then what happens is, it always trades at a large uh, discount to gold, but that uh, very small percent of the time, silver will spike up to $50 in 1980. Or, you know, it spiked up, what, in 2021, uh, 30 or something like that. But these spikes only last a day or two. You know what I mean? Um, and that'll drive the ratio back to, a, you know, a 25 to 30. But it only lasts a, uh, it only lasts a day or two. Um, so... You know, I'm much more uh, happy to see the silver price rise up here. It makes all these silver miners a lot more profitable and stay here over the longer term. I'm not interested in t trying to time a short term spike, you know? No, it makes sense. Makes sense. It's a, it's just a metric everybody looks at. So I'm curious, like if we're going to go mean revert or whatever you want to call it. I right? think it's interesting to talk about and people like it. I don't think it's a good way to invest your money. No, uh, I agree. It's like I think they're completely independent, and uh, I, I said it before, and uh, I've been getting a lot of flack for it. But silver's been trading a lot more like a base metal. Yeah. Like, I'm not saying it is a base metal. There's, there's yeah. a difference. Well, Still a monetary well, metal, right? Just I'm, to clarify. I'm, 
on the fundamental side of silver, right? There's the silver sector has been in a deficit of uh, the mine. The mines produce about um, what 800 million uh, ounces per year. Its silver sector has been in a deficit of 100 million ounces per year for like three to four years, based on the Silver Institute. And then you get stuff going on right now. You get solar that uses, you know, uh, about 20 grams of uh, silver per panel. Silver is growing massively. It's expected to grow 10x over the next whatever five, 10 years. It's going to be a major consumer of silver. You get all the EVs. You get, um, you know, the batteries that use silver. Um, and then Samsung supposedly came out with a new battery that uses what uh, a kilo of silver. You know, a thousand grams per ton. Uh, you know, and it, it's just going to continue driving silver demand. And silver, it's mostly used for as solder. For a lot of electronic circuits, like in the TV or your computer, it'll be a dot here, a dot here. But um, military applications, like a Tomahawk missile, it's rumored that it's got like, I don't know, 300 ounces of silver to make one Tomahawk missile. Why? Because silver has the highest conductivity of all metal, and the military doesn't care what stuff costs. They just want the best stuff. So, um, you know, the military uses a lot of it. And it was funny. I was speaking to Keith Newmar, and he's like, I told him that. He's like, well, we should start mining Afghanistan then. Well, a lot of people are going to Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan, right? So, yeah. or Saudi Arabia, at least the Arabian Nubian Shield. So there's going to be, there's a lot of activity, but it's mostly copper and gold these days. Not a lot of silver as, as far as I know there, but I uh, might be wrong. Yeah. Um, a lot of our guests on our, on our channel, like, it seems like we're a bit of a doom and gloom channel. I don't really want to be, but all points are, all, all signals are pointing towards a bit of a market crash or at least a, a strong correction, right? Um, and we often get the question, and I read the comments on YouTube a lot, like what happens to gold and gold mining stocks during a crash? Like, yeah, um, every time the Fed has started cutting rates, the economy slows down, the market crash. It preceded the recession, crash in 2000, crash in 2008, crash in 2019. To be honest with you, here's the alternative view. I think we're beyond that. I think the government and the Fed are spending so much money that they are attempting to offset the next major market decline. They don't want that to happen because when that happens, you know, the real estate market slows down, uh, you know, all assets get smoked, the economy goes into a tank. Um, but what if they were able to prevent this by spending lots of money? And then, you know, the price, the Dow Jones could go to, I don't know, whatever, a hundred thou, but you know where that's going to kick out and you're going to see that is an inflation. A bottle of Coke's probably going to be 50 bucks at that time. And I believe that's the road we're going down right now. Like if you look at the S&P inflation adjusted, it's only up whatever, 200, 300% over the past 20 years. Gold has crushed that return. That's why, you know, gold is the best place to be in, in times of high inflation. And this is one of those times and where, you know, the world's reserve currency, you know, has shifted from, you know, Holland to Spain to UK. Um, and the U.S. has had it for 100 years, and this is how they all end with, you know, overspending too much government insight and their currency becomes, you know, worthless. And that's where, what we're seeing right now. We're seeing the loss in purchasing power, and we're all feeling it. And it's not going to slow down. We're not going to have a balanced budget. They're going to spend more and more and more because they're going to be, be able to try to um, – Tr tr they're going to create agencies to deal with inflation, which is going to be spending more money and more money. It's we're, we're in crazy times. Well, or they publish another or they come up with another Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, just the name yeah. itself is uh, yeah. driving me nuts personally. But yeah, uh, well, the um, you know, uh, Stephanie Kelton, she's written a couple books um, and it's all about government deficits and how they don't matter. They, like you need the government to keep continuing to spend money to offset uh, you know, the, a slowing economy and that it just seems like that's been embraced, you know, by both political parties. Um, I think it's financial madness and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah. No, let, let's, let's dive a little deeper into what you're doing. Cause I've got, a, I've, I've wrote down that you really like the royalty companies. And I think we need to understand a little bit more why, especially in this, let's call it explosive gold price environment. Um, like, explain your reasoning a little bit. Like, why royalty companies? Yes, you have the, the 10x portfolio, but why, why should I own a royalty company right now? And how are they going to behave over the next 6 to 12 months? What are your expectations? Yeah, the, um, it's a portfolio of about 13 royalties. And, you know, I've, I've uh, you know, been investing in for the past three years. And, and I back tested it prior to that. And the current returns, it matches the back test. 
And just, you know, there's five major reasons. Their costs are fixed. They've got limited management. These are run with three or four or five guys. You get a lawyer, a geo, a different guy to count the money versus mining companies. They get 300, 500 employees. Um, and then uh, they get free exploration upside. They pay, they pay a fixed price, right? Uh, say whatever, $10 million for a stream. Well, Franco uh, paid $2 million for a stream on uh, Gold Strike in Nevada. You know, they've been able to generate uh, like uh, half a billion dollars from that just off their NSR. Why? Because Gold Strike, it was originally was a small open pit. They kept adding ounces and ounces and ounces. A royalty company gets all that stuff for free. Um, and then, uh, you know, the big fish, you know, always get eaten by the, uh, the small fish always get eaten by the big fish. And, you know, there's three or four smaller ones is one royalty right now. I, I know it's going to get bought out because it owns a 1% NSR on one of the largest, most attractive up and coming gold projects in the world. I know this because I follow this, um, large cap miner. I follow their conferences and I follow their presentations and, They've already amassed uh, like what 14 million ounces of gold at this project. In year two, it's expected to do 1.8 million ounces of production. It's not going to happen for a few years, but this is going to make it one of the largest gold mines in the world. And then these crown jewel assets, these royalty companies, uh, they all have these cornerstone assets that they were able to build their company about around. And these small royalties only trade at like a 5x to 10x, you know, operating cash flow multiple or now um versus the majors are traded 20x so you know immediately you're getting a huge uh burst in value um and then you know your cost no matter how price no matter how high the price of gold goes your costs remain fixed no matter how high inflation goes your costs are fixed and then one of the most amazing things is these royalties they use bankers price tax that use gold prices of like $1,800 an ounce, like five years from now, right? So immediately they're buying these gold uh, NSRs and streams at like a 20% discount, even if that's all you get is the life of mine. Uh, and you start throwing a $2,500 um, ounce gold price into your models and just the, they're paying whatever, 50 cents on the dollar off their original 10 year mine life. They're ripping the miners off. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and if you're wondering if what name of the what what name what what the name of the royalty company is, send twenty five dollars to my email address and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding, of course, but yeah, uh, we're not going to give anything away that you got in your newsletter. But I think I figured it out, and I'm going to ask you afterwards. But uh, um, whether that's the one, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know which one it is. But yeah, uh, go ahead. I'll ask you afterwards. I'm not sure if you want to share that. You got to. Oh, you can't give oh, away the secret yeah, sauce. I got, I got 30 picks of my GP10X. The GP10X is up 45%. I got four picks that are up 145%. Royalty is killing the GDX by like 10% uh, already this year. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. I'm guessing it's Origin Royalties then. Yeah, it's course. Origin. And I've been following right? Origin uh, for a long time with Patty Nickel, right? And then they've got Hermitano, uh, which First Majestic owns. Uh, and they just found more ounces at uh, below Ermitano. So it, the, that they're getting $6 million a year from that. That looks like it's going to extend over the next whatever decade. And then they've owned the Silicon Merlin, and it's been quiet. There hasn't been anything going on. And then all of a sudden, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, you started hearing peeps here and there, and Anglo Growth started showing some. They did a quick economic analysis, and the, the results are ridiculous. Um and I, I think it's worth like $19 million a year to Origin. <laughs> and like I said, the larger cap royalties trade at 20 times their uh, operating cash flow. Free cash flow. Uh, so you start modeling that in and Origin's a compelling bargain. And like, I, like I've said, I've seen the acquisitions happen. Great Bear got taken out. Abby Tibby royalties got taken out. They all get taken out with good assets. Now, 100%. And the silicon asset is an absolute monster. In, yeah. in Beatty, in Nevada, it's in the right area, it's the right jurisdiction, it's going to get built at some point. So absolutely, exactly. I fully agree. It's a monster of an asset. Yeah. Um, Garrett, absolute wonderful conversation. Well, we'll have a conversation, of course, as well. Um, where can we follow your work? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Garrett Goggin, and you can go to the Golden Portfolio. Sign up for my free uh, Secrets of a Mining Analyst Masterclass, where I discuss, you know, a lot of stuff I talked about with Kyle here today. 
No, fantastic. We'll definitely link to it down below as well. And uh, really appreciative of your time. Thanks so much for sharing all your insights, Garrett, and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you found this conversation useful and informative. That's the whole point why we're doing them. If you did, please leave a like, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel. It helps us out tremendously, broaden our reach. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on SOAR Financially. Thank you. Thank you.